vote for the one you did. How can you support vegetarianism if plants have feelings too? How dare a May court condemn to death a man if we, the liberal elite, want no death penalty? And why is it not clear to you that every single crime that is committed must be blamed on one political party alone, the one I didn't vote for? Welcome to No Laughing Matter, the third and final section of Poles Apart, Beyond's documentary on polarization. It's a world inhabited by intolerant tolerance, fundamentalist liberals, smooth-tongued right-wingers, sanctimonious extremists. There's no civility left anymore. I am Sana Khan and I'm going to accompany you through the disturbingly abusive landscape of public discourse today. Blame it on the Greeks, Plato, Xenophon and Aristotle, who lived between 427 and 322 before the Christian era. Aristotle's book Politica lent its name to the most contentious, maddening, widespread but indispensable practice of civil society around the world, politics. Politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly and applying the wrong remedies. That was American comedian Groucho Marx who drew plenty of laughs for this borrowed quotation and other bombos he dropped with success along with his siblings, the Marx brothers. Take a closer look at both the governors and the governed around the world over the past three years alone. There seems no shortage of quacks and plenty of misdiagnosis. Social norms for the birds. Scoffing the law, of course, it's a free world, isn't it? Coarseness has spread around the globe like wildfire, amply supported by technology's most dubious achievement to date, the social media. Is United States President Donald Trump alone responsible for the deterioration in American public discourse? Is the US's most controversial motormouth Republican president to date behind the disappearance of informed debate? Many insist he is. The media is more partisan than ever. Supporters of both Democrats and Republicans posting on the social media too have abandoned logic, rationale and humor in their mutual attacks. Nobody agrees to disagree anymore. It's more like let's each abusively defend our positions to death, be it yours or mine. It's a peculiar public outrage that rules out all possible censure by placing our very existence at the core of one's impassioned blather. Ironically, some of the biggest champions of democracy, free speech, some of the loudest voices against the death penalty, for instance, have railed against Trump in the most intolerant terms. Trump must hang, tweeted a professor in California. A best-selling author lashed out at the US president for ignoring a handicapped child in a wheelchair. When the child's mother corrected her through other pictures, the author mumbled an apology. But to the mother, not to Trump, of course. He's a writer, a former United Nations diplomat and a public speaker of repute. Shashi Tharoor of India's Oppositional Congress Party examines the phenomenon of polarization around the world and in India. I've always said that uh, Trump's Make America Great Again slogan was also about Make America White Again. In many ways, it was a dying kick of a certain identity, a white uh, uh, American existence. There's a recent uh, breakdown of the last election, which says that Trump actually swept the white working class by 22 percent, the white middle class by 28 percent, the white affluent class by 19 percent. In other words, his margins over Hillary in all segments of white voters was extraordinarily high. At the same time, make America white again is no longer possible. By sheer demography, the, uh, why the American labor force is going to stop being white majority by 2030. There's no way you can avoid it. There will be retirements, there will be deaths, and that'll, that's, an, that's a story that's heading over. If you're a Democrat, then it's Republicans at fault. If you vote to Trump, then it was Obama to blame, of course. Either way, and when the argument is about black or white, a scapegoat must be found. And a small but crucial aspect of democracy overlooked conveniently that you voted both men to power. 
I, you know, I studied in America 40 years ago. There was no serious talk about nationalization. The left and right were much closer together. Democrats and Republicans were often uh, indistinguishable from each other. I, I even wrote about them being, in some cases, you know, Tweedledum and Tweedledumer. It's going very far. I mean, a friend of mine who actually I shouldn't name, the former American ambassador, said to me that in his family, when his daughter announced that she was dating a Republican, they told her, well, you know, you, you, we can't tell you who you can see and not see, but he is not welcome for Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, that kind of thing is very strong. And I think, you know, we haven't yet reached the stage uh, in, in, in our country where we've got to that point where somebody will say, don't bring a BJP voter to our to our table for Diwali or whatever. But, you know, this is this. There is a polarization. There's no question about it. Why is it so? It's partly because certain periods, I think, accentuate the significance of these differences. I mean, there are people who um, uh, in the old days would have seen the differences as relatively inconsequential and therefore not enough to break up a friendship over uh, or whatever. But today these are seen as much more fundamental life and death issues. There's no middle ground anymore. We on Surya Gangadharan and Andy Roskin examine the point of no return that American citizens seem to have reached when it comes to their country and its presidents. America is increasingly polarized. Pro and anti-Trump protests have galvanized other groups into taking sides. Political disagreements are turning violent. Some say the polarization is undermining the foundations of America's democracy and political system. From university campuses to state capitals and small towns, protests are snowballing across America. Those out in the streets generally represent two broad streams of the political spectrum. They are pro or anti-Trump and speak their mind. Anti-free speech as an ideology is a virus that grows. If we don't stand against the attack on free speech in Berkeley, then it won't be long before it's in my neighborhood and I have to be worried about my political belief. The pundits say it's normal for people to disagree on their politics. I mean, I hate to sort of uh, throw cold water on uh, everyone that believes that we're in the most polarizing times in the history of the Republic, not even close. But there's a sense that those disagreements are taking on a bitter new tone. That increasingly Americans are divided into camps that is threatening the very foundation of the political system. Some trace this polarization to Donald Trump and what is seen as his divisive brand of politics. Trump's demeanor a marked departure from predecessors. He is seen as someone who is willing to attack opponents. He is willing to say whatever is on his mind, make whatever accusation he wants to. Trump critics, who are generally Democrats, say his rhetoric is xenophobic and racist. It is against the American vision of tolerance. It is an affront to a nation of immigrants. Equality is written in founding documents, and therefore any Republican who stands with him or votes for him is guilty. The other side says it is the Democrats who are un-American. They have denigrated a Christian nation by secularizing everything. They have sacrificed American sovereignty to globalist institutions. They have undermined America's exceptional heritage by allowing immigrants. The real America is where there are no Democrats. A PW research study in 2014 found that partisan antipathy is deeper and more extensive than at any time in the last two decades. Two years later, PW reported that 45% of Republicans and 41% of Democrats felt that the other party's policies posed a threat to the nation. Donald Trump has stirred up a lot of emotions that perhaps some Americans felt for a long time. But he, his own boorish and disgusting behavior and his attitudes toward people who don't measure up to his view of the world have caused this sort of exponential increase in, in, this, uh, in these attitudes by his followers. The divisions have been exacerbated by the lack of interpersonal contact across party lines. The New York Times reported in June that American neighborhoods, workplaces, households and even online dating lives 
have become politically homogenous. Bipartisan marriages are on the decline. Interpersonal contact is known to ease prejudice against racial minorities and gays. Psychologists believe that more such contact would be good for political civility too. But increasingly, Americans live in a world where that contact is hard to come by and many go out of their way to avoid it. It is true that democracy cannot exist without partisanship. The problem is when it overwhelms everything else. Then it becomes difficult for democracy to function. It leads to democracy breakdown and violence, which is what's happening in America today. Bureau Report, Real. The Palace of Westminster and Britain as a whole are renowned as the original homes of biting wit, finely tuned intellectual sarcasm, witty repartee without resorting to abuse. If Gladstone fell into the Thames, that would be a misfortune, said British politician and twice Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli of a political rival. And if anybody pulled him out, that, I suppose, would be a calamity. Unquote. No abuse, yet biting enough to make a point. More a ventriloquist's dummy than a Prime Minister is how a Tory MP once described British Labour Prime Minister John Major. A vivid and somewhat funny description, but nothing lethal or poisonous. Americans always try to do the right thing after they've tried everything else, said Winston Churchill, the erstwhile British Prime Minister, legendary for his acerbic wit and sharp one-liners. These insults may have outraged many all those decades ago, but compared to today's incontinent attacks, especially on the social media, they read like well-crafted poetry. After the Manchester bombing in May 2017, a popular UK columnist tweeted demanding a quote-unquote final solution against Muslims. An election candidate of the racist United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, posted a picture of black folded deck umbrellas accompanied by a weak attempt at humour. Quote, I spent an hour trying to talk to them, trying to learn about their culture, unquote. The crude punchline followed, quote, until the bartender cut me off and told me they were patio umbrellas, unquote. Latent racial superiority is nothing new in us while colonizing powers, and England's colonies were particularly widespread. But like the election of President Trump seems to have unplugged dams of hatred, it was the Brexit referendum in Britain in June 2016 that, as Shakespeare wrote, must have let slip the dogs of war, dripping with vitriol and bad taste. Shashi Tharoor explains to Weon why 52% of the UK voted to leave the European Union. I believe Brexit brought out something which actually had been papered over till then, uh, or maybe simply that the publicly expressed conventional wisdom concealed this. But essentially what we saw in Britain was that uh, in Brexit, there were very, very clearly two kinds of massive polarizations in the society. One was anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner, and here it didn't matter whether the foreigners were brown or white. People in England resented hearing East European languages on the bus or on the street, and they actually were anti-immigrants of any sort, not just on racial grounds. The second polarization was actually um, uh, um, about those who wanted to resurrect a certain proud UK independence, and literally headed by a party called the UK Independence Party away from integrated international institutions like the EU and the UN, but particularly like the EU. Because the British felt, I think, that they had lost control of their lives, that decisions were taken by unelected European bureaucrats sitting in Brussels. I was in London for the Brexit vote and for a week before that. And I spoke to people, and practically everybody I spoke to by a margin of 90, 95%, were themselves going to vote Remain and expected the vote to be in favor of Remain. Uh, so when the results came, I went down to the computer at 6 o'clock in the morning to log into the news. I was stunned to discover that Britain had voted for Brexit. Indeed, London did go overwhelmingly for Remain, but the, the backlash that the polarization that Brexit revealed was also a polarization between London and the counties, between the people in the surrounding areas and the people of cosmopolitan 
London the capital. And all of these polarizations, I think, boil down to a desire to reassert a sort of little England motif, which they felt had been lost in globalization and Europeanization. Mahatma Gandhi once compared politics to the coils of a snake. No matter how much one tried, he said, it was tough to wiggle out of its coils. So, it was best one wrestled with it. Like other countries, India too has seen millions of closet commentators spit out their most poisonous venom, usually under pseudonyms, on anything and everything that made headlines. And frequently that vitriol takes on dangerous overtones. When trolls threaten a woman whose opinion they don't like with gang rape, the very crime that propelled India into international headlines just a few years ago. When anonymous tweeters accuse judges of corruption. When foul-mouthed Facebookers wish murder upon a public figure they don't like. Be it a discussion on how holy cows really are, on how good a given article is, or how articulate a television anchor, at the core of the mudslinging in India today seems to be Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of India since 2014. The BJP's Member of Parliament in the Upper House of the Rajya Sabha, an eloquent speaker, Shopon Das Gupta, talks to Vion on why this is so. After the 2002 riots in Gujarat, a certain brand of finger pointing started and the response to it was equally virulent. So it was that which created the circumstances and ironically the more the fingers were pointed at Modi, the more he tried to get away and focus on governance. But his opponents kept on on this question of a sectarian divide. And that came to a head after he was nominated the BJP candidate. And so throughout the 2013-14 election campaign, and it was a long election campaign, we saw issues which in an intellectual way was posited as the idea, competing ideas of India. But on the ground, it translated into a complete breakdown of the consensual relationship which had existed between the government and the opposition. And I think that pattern persists. Mr. Modi was never indicted in any judicial process. Despite that, there was a very sustained attempt made to influence the judiciary. There was a very sustained effort to actually rule him out of politics rather than confront him or take him on in a normal political way. And I think that process came to an end sometime around 2013 when he became, he was nominated as the BJP's candidate. And at that time, there was a belief in the Congress in other opposition parties, that Modi was too polarizing a figure. Now, I don't want to go into the merits or demerits of what, what that meant, but it certainly suggested that India, in many ways, wanted a certain break from the type of politics which we had been accustomed to earlier. And Modi represented or symbolized that yearning to make that break. And as that became clearer, the Ancien regime, the more established people who felt that their basic existence, their relevance, etc. were being threatened and jeopardized, they went hammer and tongs at him. And they were the establishment. They controlled the levers of intellectual power. Intolerance has become the lingua franca of the so-called free world and those with no hopes of their rapidity making it to publishing are perhaps the most fluent in it. But there are other forms of obstinacy and disregard for India's democracy too. A refusal by opposition politicians to even listen to the party in power and repeatedly hold up sessions of parliament at the cost of the taxpayer. Shashi Tharoor blames this kind of polarization on both the Congress and the BJP. Well, I think it actually really begins with the defeat of the BJP in 2004 because the BJP weren't expecting to lose 
and they found it very difficult to stomach their defeat. I know Prime Minister Manmohan Singh spoke to me uh, in New York uh, that year about how hurt he was when, for the first time in the history of independent India, as Prime Minister, he wasn't even allowed to introduce his government, his ministers, to Parliament because he was shouted down by the BJP. And he said that he was treated with such um, uh, hostility by these people that from then onwards he realized there wasn't going to be any bipartisanship. That kind of political polarization uh, was extreme, had not been seen before. I'm afraid what has happened, of course, is that the golden rule of politics now is do unto others what they have done unto you. And so the Congress in opposition is being equally disruptive in return. And I think it is something that has been lost. Not just civility has been lost, but the possibility of decent consultations between the government and the opposition on identifying areas of common national interest, which ought to be the dominant trope in our politics, has been sidelined. But it's partly because both parties doubt very sincerely the legitimacy of the other. And that kind of delegitimization of the other is there on both sides, and that's contributed to political polarization. Things are made by social media. Every action usually has an equal and opposite reaction. But though he may be from the BJP, Shokun Das Gupta seems to agree with Shashi Tharoor. I think there was a large section of the BJP which took the defeat of 2004 in very bad grace. They somehow believed that this, they couldn't explain it to themselves. And they believed that this was a fragile coalition, which if you sustain, if you, if you maintain a certain decibel level in parliament, you would be able to unseat them. And I think that was a, it was a self-defeating, short-sighted strategy. And it came to haunt them because after 2014, it was the Congress and the others which decided to actually replicate that strategy and do this complete disruption. So we are now having a situation where at least now the Lok Sabha is functioning okay, but the Rajya Sabha is reasonably dysfunctional. But I think what we are witnessing at times is that the discourse is almost the level of pamphleteering. So there's been a decline in the intellectual level. And I think the reason for it is that unless you can get over this thing of an extreme and total polarization that either you're pro-government or anti-government and there's no sort of meeting ground between the two. And we saw this in the de debate on demonetization. We've seen it in the debate on Aadhaar. We've seen it in other issues where it has to be a black and white. But trolls don't restrict themselves to the work of elected politicians. If you are from a party they dislike, then such intolerance can extend to your personal life too. Take the case of murdered journalist Gauri Lankesh. In the early days, the only bits of evidence available were two scraps of grainy CCTV footage. And yet, all Congress-supporting tweeters had solved the case even before the police had opened the investigation. It was the BJP and its supporters, of course, who had murdered the editor because of her anti-BJP views. I think there's a bitter irony in this. When social media first came onto the scene, people looked upon it as an enlarged democratic space which would enable people who were hitherto voiceless to actually express themselves, express themselves to the important people, engage with them, perhaps with a measure of insolence. Because, you know, after all, someone, if you just got a voice, you, you are likely to be a little insolent. But over the years, this has just acquired a terrible dimension. And we saw that in the Gauri Lankesh thing. I mean, within minutes of that, the case had been solved in the minds of certain people. Now, there are lots of pieces of circumstantial evidence. There are, there are patchy, you know, direct evidence. As outsiders, as an ordinary citizen, we are not privy to all those things. What exactly has happened? Or what are the complexities of this case? What are the question marks? What, what are the dead ends, etc.? No, the, the reason is very simple. People feel 
that everybody is a fair game. And I see a large number of people, both men and women, incidentally, I mean, I, th I, th I think it's pretty gender neutral in this case, who have all the time in the world and who've created a make-believe world where their only public engagement is via Twitter or via some other platform. And they believe that they, and, and the number of likes they get, the number of retweets they get, that is determining their entire existence. That's a very disturbing phenomena. It, it's, a, it's a new social phenomena, perhaps it's a new psychological phenomena, which needs to be think. And the Gauri Lankesh episode really suggested that. I would say that people have not blamed the BJP per se, but they have blamed, however, the uh, the right-wing forces of the Sangh Parivar for a different reason. And that is that in the last three years, we have seen three very similar assassinations carried out by gunshots. We've seen Narendra Dabolkar, we've seen Govind Pansare, and we've seen M.M. Kalburgi, and all three of them were united by their rationalism, by their attacks on religion and superstition, and therefore their unfriendliness towards Hindutva. And all three were killed in very similar circumstances to Gauri Lankesh, who was also a rationalist, also an atheist, also publicly critical of religion and of Hindutva. So, the, 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 the logic uh, does suggest that if the three things the, of the three earlier killings that, that were in common were applied to her, then that must be the same sort of people who went after her. Now, I think speculation of that nature or sort of drawing the interconnections and the dots is not unfair. Coming to a conclusion before the police have done their investigation is unfair and should not be acceptable. At the same time, it is reflective of the polarization across in society. We are somehow prepared to believe the worst of anybody on the other side. But can one really fool all the people all the time? Are most people so gullible that they can be swayed by the intemperate language and abuse that dominate the social media? Beyond's Jessica Taneja asked around and here's what she found. When we look at like, you know, platforms like Twitter or Facebook, we basically tend to follow or befriend people who we like or people who we already associate with. So basically the idea is just having like-minded people around you. When you have like-minded people around you, any opinions that they share, you always have a source or a way to get that reinforced. If you do reinforce that opinion, you're always going to feel a lot stronger about it. It's basic human tendency. Even when we were uh, kids, we would always choose friends who would basically, you know, actually have the same thought process as us. So it's basically now it's more like building a virtual cocoon, if I, if I could say that. So people basically just have this thing where they want constant reaffirmation and they will have people who are doing that for them. Polarization. The greater the global village grows, the more mankind is creating sub-communities marked by paranoia and mistrust. Sub-castes based on the colour of one's skin. Coffee clubs restricted by one's religion. And social groups based on one's political choice. What happened to the middle ground? It has come into its own in many countries around the world, notably the ones ruled by grand coalitions. Will India eventually reach that point on the paradigm of development? Or are Indians by nature too strongly fragmented to ever come together as they did to shake off the British rule? I am Sana Khan. Thanks so much for watching.